The following program contains a topic which may not be suitable for young viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Caring for and maintaining our mental health is an important priority. The process of aging, changes to independence, financial concerns or a change in roles can all lead to mental health issues. On this episode of Underestimated, presented by Oatley Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers and brought to you by Spinal Cord Injury Ontario, we're discussing mental health and the importance of self-care. Nature and Forest Therapy Guide Beth Foster joins us in studio to share the healing power of nature. Dean Wardak shares his remarkable story of overcoming physical and mental health challenges after a devastating accident left him with spinal cord and brain injuries. And Amber Scott joins me to talk about her lived experience with mental health and how the patient, client, and family council advocates for change in the healthcare system and broader community. Having wandered in the woods all her life, Beth Foster has learned that sometimes you can go further by sitting quietly in one place and watching the wonder unfold. As a nature and forest therapy guide and trail certification consultant, she delights in guiding others to an awareness, understanding, and deeper appreciation of the healing power of nature as a tool for peace and prosperity. Welcome, Beth. Thanks, Tori. Lovely to be here. So to start, can you tell us a bit about your background and your interest in mental health and self-care? Sure. I've, uh, I've been a person who knew uh, that to feel better all my life, I've need I've needed to go outside. So that has been my happy place. Um, I, for many years I was a, a high school teacher and towards the end of my career I was working, I was a drama teacher working in a black room, all black, no windows, and a guidance counselor working in a brick room with no windows. By noon everything ached, eyes, head, body, back, but I was fortunately near a green space, so I started wandering in the woods at lunch, 20 minutes, and I immediately felt better. I was able to uh, problem solve, I was able to be alert and energetic in the afternoon. At one point, someone said, you're forest bathing. Like everyone else, I laughed, what's that? Started researching it and realized that's what I was doing, that's what I've always loved, that's what has always made me feel better, and then I decided to become a guide. So what is forest bathing? Forest bathing literally is a translation of a Japanese word shindin yoku, which means to bathe in the essence of the forest. We are lucky because in Barrie we have a, a sort of our showpiece park is Sunnydale Park. It's almost 50 acres. It's a protected green space, uh, recreational day use, and that's my what I call that my home my home park. I traditionally guide there a lot, but we also have Springwater Park on the edge of town, and we have I think a hundred. 80 parks in Barrie and I'm actually guiding in many of them. Uh, we just need a, a quieter forest canopy a little bit removed from as or as much removed as possible from noises generated by humans like cars mm. um, and leaf blowers. Um, and uh, so Barrie is rich in the availability of forest bathing places. And how has it helped you? What's, what's one experience that really stands out for you? Certainly how it's helped me was during COVID when so many of us were isolated and as a person who needs to be outside and, and where there were invitations to shelter in place, um, I would still go outside walking, walking on my own. Um, at that point, uh, the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy Guides that I was certified through started recognizing that guides were struggling because we're all nature-based um, uh, people and they started just among the guide population offering virtual guides. So uh, virtual guided forest bathing experiences. So. In one, for instance, I was being guided by a person on the 18th floor of a, an apartment building where she had been for two weeks. She saw nothing green out her window, but she could see the wind blowing through the laundry of her, on her neighbor's balcony. Um, 
and so certainly virtual forest bathing, which sounds uh, contradictory, has been hu has been huge. Okay. But getting back into the woods since COVID has been right. wonderful. And how accessible is forest bathing for people with mobility disabilities? Yeah. Um, it's very accessible. A typical forest bathing walk walk would be in two to three hours. You would only go one kilometer, but um, they can be done in a garden. I've done them in Sunnydale Park Gardens, in the Royal Botanical Gardens, where people who have mobility issues are able to just sit. They can sit by a tree, by a plant, by um, some flowers, and if they can look at the sky and and touch and smell some of the natural things that are around them, that makes it wonderful. Similarly, if you can't even get out of your house, you can work, you can do, a, a, you can get that connect, connection with nature, which is what the forest bathing walk is really about. You can get that sitting in a chair, looking out a window, um, looking at clouds, uh, looking at a bird or an insect or something outside your window. What did you bring here, Beth? Perhaps I you brought stuff show. that um, many people have just sitting, sitting on their desks or at home. Um, I brought a, a little piece of cedar, which I just love because, and cedar's considered sacred by many cultures, not just First Nations in Canada. Um, I love to smell it, but I can engage with all my senses through a piece of cedar because it's been uh, uh, something that I've loved all my life, just smelling it immediately calms me down. But I also brought a shell, a pine cone, a rock, a piece of birch bark, a feather, and they are all things that many of us collect when we're uh, on holidays because we love those things. And you can um, experience connection with nature through those things that may just be sitting on a, on a bookshelf. So for me, as someone who's not tried it before, what would mm -hmm. be an entry-level invitation that you would offer? Mm -hmm. An entry-level invitation, I will give it to you right now, would be to um, look at this piece of cedar, and if you're comfortable, I would invite you to close your eyes and then to just explore it with your fingertips. Notice the textures. Notice the smooth bits. Notice the pointy bits. And if you want, you could rub it on the back of your hand or on your face just to notice the difference in the texture. Even notice the, the part of the stem, um, how that feels and, and imagining what you think that would look like if you had never seen it. You can also smell that piece. You can give it a little nibble because cedar is, if you want, <laughs> it's, it's healthy. It's rich in vitamin C. I often make tea out of it on a forest bathing walk. So that that is a way that you could engage with a piece of cedar, you could engage with a strawberry in the same ways. You could touch it, mm -hmm. you could smell it, you could taste that, you could rub it on your skin if you don't mind getting <laughs> red stuff on your face. And, um, and even listening, you could, uh, you could crinkle that or make a little breeze in front of your ear and all your senses would have been engaged. Thank you so much for joining us today, Beth, and giving these great ideas for how to um, access self-care and forest bathing no matter where we live. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Tori. Oli Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers are proud sponsors of Underestimated. If you need a personal injury lawyer, we can help. For more information, please visit OatleyVigman.com. On the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, we encourage Canadians to pause and remember all that veterans have sacrificed for us, lest we forget. With Rogers TV, you can cheer on the home team from the comfort of your living room. We'll head to the rink, the field, the court, or the pitch so you don't have to. Tune in and cheer on your local amateur athletes on Rogers TV.
So before my injury, before my accident, I was a teenager that was going through um, Humber College. I was in the um, home renovation program. I was in the midst of my party phase, and me and my friends would party quite a bit. So I was really partying heavily, drinking heavily, having lots of fun. On April 16, 2011, my best friend at the time was hosting his 19th birthday party. My friend lives on the same street I lived on. So I walked to the point and left my car in my driveway because I knew I was going to be drinking that night. Unfortunately, later that night, I would end up leaving the party, walking back to my house, getting into my car and driving off of the street. And I would crash my car into a tree going nearly 100 kilometers an hour. And that's how I suffered my brain injury and my spinal cord injury. I was put on life support and I remained in a coma for a week. And then so after I, after I was in the coma, the doctors told my family to actually consider removing me off of life support because she, they didn't think I was gonna survive the accident. They thought I was never gonna come out of my coma. Luckily I did end up waking up from my coma but even after that, like, I was so severely injured. Like, when I came out of my coma, my eyes were crossed. Like, my one eye was pointed towards my nose. So, like, that was a big indication of how severe my brain damage was. I had to learn how to talk again. I had to learn who everyone was again. I couldn't even tell the time on the clock anymore. So like, I had to learn everything again. So it's kind of like being born again. And then yeah, it's been a slow progression. I've worked hard in physiotherapy, worked hard in other, other therapies like speech therapy. And so I've come a long way and like now my speech is pretty understandable. I'm now able to give motivational talks to high school students. They can hear me just fine. And so I've come a long way. Oh yeah, I've faced many, many challenges. Like getting used to being a quadriplegic, getting used to not having any arm, hand, arm and hand function, getting used to being dependent on other people to do everything for you was a really hard thing to get used to. Like I got severely depressed. Like I would cry when I would go to bed. I would cry myself to sleep. I would, yeah, I would, I had suicidal ideation. Like, I even thought about how I would kill myself. So I've slowly learned how to overcome the negative thoughts, how to be optimistic, how to focus on the say positive things, how to do things on my daily routine to say promote better mental health. So it's been a slow progression. And like, I'm still learning now. Like, there's still times where like, life happens and I still get sad. It's not full on depression, but like I'll get sad, I'll get frustrated. And like I'm still learning how to deal with those things. My exercise, I think it's played a big factor into my mental health. So I've developed a really hard workout routine that I do on a daily basis. Every day I work out, say, two to three hours a day. And all the day, it just makes me feel so good. Working out and exercising just puts me into a better mood. And so it's played a huge factor into my mental health and my well-being. A really big help for me was my family support. Like my dad is the number one. Like he's become my caregiver. Like he does everything for me. Showering, toileting, and dressing. Also, I come from a very religious family. So like my faith in God, my faith has really helped me get through it too. Also having me get through some of the worst times. Just having the faith that living to fight another day will be rewarding in the end. And it has been because my life is a great thing now. I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm still learning to maintain that happiness. And so this has been a good progression. So I graduated from New York University and the professional wedding program with a uh, Magna cum laude, so that's like a special Latin designation where you finish with like an almost perfect GPA. 
So when I finished with Magna Cum Laude, it was like a huge accomplishment for me considering my disability, considering I have a brain injury, considering all the challenges I have to face. So I was very proud of myself for that. So I'm currently in the midst of writing a book about my accident. Everything like dealing with depression, my rehabilitation, and making new friends, everything, going back to school. I'm writing a book about my journey to inspire people, to show them that like life can be tough. We all have so much potential for our lives and we all just have to make the necessary choices to reach that full potential. And I just want everyone to create amazing lives for themselves. I was in an accident caused by me drinking and driving. So like while I was in the hospital, I was feeling terrible that I made such a poor decision to drink and drive. So I made the commitment while I was in the hospital that I was going to use my story to discourage other people from drinking and driving. So after I was discharged from the hospital and everything, I was connected to the PL police where they helped me start my, um, I would call it public speaking because I was just discouraging people from the drinking and driving and talking about the dangers of drinking and driving. But over the years, my motivational speaking, my presentation has come a long way actually. Like drinking and driving is still a part of my talk. But now I can talk about more things, like what I accomplished in school. So I talk about the importance of working hard. I talk about the importance of discipline. I talk about some of the gains I made in my rehabilitation because of the hard work I put in every day to my exercising, to my training. And I'm very happy that my, that my story and my presentation has come along this way. Because honestly, I just love inspiring people. Some of the feedback I get from these students is remarkable. Like I have students come up to me saying they, they were dealing with depression. They were feeling like really hard things that they were dealing with. But then after talking to me and hearing my story, I put things into perspective for them that they think maybe what I'm going through isn't that bad after all. The one thing I would say is, don't lose hope because it may seem really bad now but one is time will heal you'll learn to adapt and there's lots of things that you can do still even though you're disabled to live a fun happy life and then number two is to keep working hard of course like having a spinal cord injury there's a big spectrum of what type of function remains intact what i would just say is Work hard so that you can reach your full potential of your functionality. Oli Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers are proud sponsors of Underestimated. If you need a personal injury lawyer, we can help. For more information, please visit OatleyVigman.com. It's closing time, and you stayed out longer than you planned. So now you can't drive, and the buses have stopped running. You could always call your girlfriend, or maybe your roommate. What about your best friend? You could just dial 1888 Taxi Guy or use the Taxi Guy app. The call and the app are free, and they both connect you to a local cab company to bring you home safely. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive alive, drive sober. Public transit. Garbage pickup, parks and recreation programs, snow removal on your street. How can you stay informed about these and other important local services? Tune to City Council coverage on Rogers TV. See your community leaders at work on Rogers TV City Council coverage. The Patient, Client, and Family Council is a nonprofit organization that started in the mid 1990s as a consumer survivor initiative. Amber Scott from PCFC is here to talk about her lived experience with mental health and how the PCFC advocates for change in the healthcare system and broader community. Welcome, Amber. Thank you. So to start, what is PCFC? Well, the PCFC is, um, as you said, a nonprofit organization. 
um, we kind of play several roles. Um, we have, you know, we offer services, um, peer support services, both in the community um, and within Waypoint, um, which is um, one of our contracts. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy work. Um, it's our experience and engagement department, so we, we do a lot of advocating for um, people that aren't able to advocate for themselves and bringing um, patient voice forward, um, trying to drive some of that system change for mental health and addictions. Um, and that's, that's really some of the, the larger work um, that we're doing. Um, as well as um, helping people with lived experience learn how to share their story um, and learning some of the skills that are needed to do that, um, as well as giving them opportunities to, to do that as well. So, um, so we're an organization um, full of people with lived experience, and that's, that's it. Every single person up to our executive director, um, everyone has their own lived experience, so. Um, so can you share <laughs> a bit about that? How did you get involved with PCFC? Yeah, I, um, I got involved with PCFC. Um, I was finishing up my social service worker diploma, um, and I really, you know, during the time that I had done my um, schooling was some of the time that I struggled greatly as well. Um, and I just wanted to use the experience that I've had um, to be able to help other people. That really was my only goal. I, I, it didn't matter to me how I did that. Um, and I saw this job posting for a peer support worker with PCFC and, uh, and I applied for it. And, um, and that's how I ended up with, with PCFC. And um, I'm able to use some of my experience. Um, you know, I have experience back from when I was um, quite young, um, so I'm able to use that to, to help other people. And since then, I've made my way throughout the organization in multiple different roles and um, getting to, to use that experience in different ways, which is um, amazing and something I'd never be able to do with a diploma. Um, so it's really amazing. So what is the benefit of peer support in supporting others in improving their mental health and self-care? Well, I think there's just, with peer support specifically, I think there's something so unique and special about being able to talk to someone who has been in a similar situation. Um, because it's one thing to talk to someone that has you know, read the books, uh, gone to school, read the books, and is like, I've read this, here, do this, this is what the book tells you to do, but has never experienced it. Whereas when you've experienced it and said, hey, like, this is, you know, this is what I did when I was experiencing a similar thing. Um, and it's also really helpful to say, hey, I went through a similar thing and I got through it. And like giving that hope to other people mm -hmm. that like, this is a really, unfortunate situation that you're in, it's like, it is, it sucks. <laughs> um, but you're gonna get through this. I got through it, you can get through it too. Um, and just being able to give people hope. And that's not something that a, reading a book can give people. So I think that's something special about peer support is peers meeting peers where they're at mm -hmm. and giving them, you know, what they need and using their own experiences, so. What are the biggest mental health related needs you see in the community? Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now is, um, you know, right now I'm based a lot uh, within Waypoint, um, which is the um, mental health center. Um, and I, what I see a lot is people that are being discharged back into the community but don't have the support within the community, especially when it comes to like housing. Um, like there's such a housing crisis, um, even for employed people. Like there's so many employed people that they like, can't afford housing. Um, and it's either the, you, you have a house or you eat. <laughs> it's one or the other, it's, um, it's really horrible. Um, so I th we see a lot of that, of, of people being discharged into the community with no plan in place um, or no 
like that's part of mental health like you need all of these pieces and housing is included in that you know nutrition is included in that and when you don't have all of these pieces how can you have good mental health so when you're being discharged from somewhere where you're already struggling with your mental health how how are you expected to succeed in that situation right so yeah. um it's yeah it's a big a big issue that we're we're seeing um that that definitely needs to be dealt with that's for sure and how do you deal with the stress of the the job trying to yeah. meet all these interconnected needs where there's no easy solutions in place yeah i think um i think something i've just learned is you know doing my best knowing that i'm doing my best to help other people giving the resources i can give them and knowing that that's as much as i can do um because like i am one of those people that want to go to the end of the earth for <laughs> for mm. for other people and and i and i feel other people's pain um and i wish i could solve all of their problems for them but i'm just you know we're not super women um right. or super men or super days um, so um we we can only do so much so i think that's really what gets me through it is knowing as long as I did everything that I could, um, just hoping that those supports will fall in place for them. Um, yeah. So where should people go to learn more about PCFC or if they're experiencing mental health issues in their community? Yeah, I would say just reach out to us. Um, if, I mean, regardless of what you're looking for, um, if you're looking for peer support, um, we have our community peer support that you can call anytime. Like we don't have a wait list. Um, so you can call and say, hey, I need to speak to a peer support worker. And usually within a week, we'll have you connected with someone. Um, and if you're, you're an organization that wants to figure out how to involve people with lived experience, we're, we're happy to help with that as well and, and guide you through that. Um, and, and we sit on lots of committees as well. So um, if someone's ever needing, you know, the voice of the lived experience to bring that forward, we're, we're there as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you for watching this episode of Underestimated, presented by Oatley Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers and brought to you by Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. Myths and stigma persist about mental health, but by learning more about them, you can help pave the way toward greater acceptance. If you have concerns about your mental health, Spinal Cord Injury Ontario has resources and supports for you and your family. To learn more, visit Spinal Cord Injury Ontario online. Crisis Services Canada is there if you need more urgent assistance. You can visit their website as well. Thank you to our guests for sharing their experience and expertise. I'm Tori Bowman and we'll see you next time. <music>